Thank you very much, Graham, and, and thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I, th I was trying to count up. I think this must be about the fifth time that I've talked at the studio school about money over the last 20 years. And it, it seems, seems strange to keep on and on about the same subject in that way. But that's part of, part of the whole thing about money. He's, he's an extraordinarily difficult painter to come to grips with. On the one hand, there's the Monet madly overexposed who appears year after year in calendars that one likes to send to one's, one's uh, aunts. Um, and then on the other hand, there's this painter who quite clearly, in some way that's awfully hard to put one's finger on, is right at the very root of modern art. And by modern art, I mean good old modern art. Modern art that, <laughs> that includes uh, everything from Cezanne to, to de Kooning, and after that begins to get a little bit questionable. I'm talking about modern art. <clears throat> How is it that we feel so confident in describing Monet as one of the f right there in the foundation of modern art. Well, that in itself is a very, very complex question. But one of the things that one could point to in the course of his, of his development from his early years painting when he first began to paint directly from, from uh, landscape to his final years when he was painting the great, um, the great uh, Namphaeus decorations. One of the things that one can point to during the course of that evolution is that progressively it gets to be more and more difficult to make a distinction between the form of his paintings and the content of his paintings. It gets to be more and more difficult to split off in a, in a familiar classical sense what the paintings are of and how the paintings present themselves to the eye. Now, just that fact alone makes him demand our attention if we're to understand anything about the subsequent development of painting. Just that fact alone. And the fact that that, that transition happened visibly during the course of his long working life. The uh, kind of argument that I want to develop uh, during this, this talk is that that strange transition during his, his working life has a great deal to do with the very nature of his enterprise. And as we know, his, as everybody knows, his enterprise was to see what happened what would happen if he committed himself as thoroughly as he possibly could to working directly from the landscape, directly out of doors, and making out of what had up until that time historically been thought of as simply an activity of sketching and gaining information uh, later to be worked up in, in, in the studio, uh, making paintings uh, making paintings out of sketches, making pictures out of sketches, and uh, uh, doing so without recourse to traditional means, but doing so in the belief that it was possible for a painter to paint naively. That's to say, without recourse to learning, to uh, classified picture types uh, and to, to uh, trust simply uh, in his own 
powers of observation and his own uh, uh, directness and to use the current phrase of the time, his own naivety as he painted. <clears throat> the, the two paintings that you see on the screen were painted in 1880. And I should just say that I'm, I'm not uh, tackling the subject chronologically at all this evening. I'm jumping about from point to point. 1880 is, is a sort of middle point. He had already, uh, for, for 15 years, been painting actively out of doors and directly. And uh, had already made a, a, a tremendous name for himself among advanced circles as the most radical of the open air painters whose, whose um, uh, ad advances into this unknown country of uh, direct painting were more uh, courageous and more daring than any, of his, uh, than any other painter. But by 1880, his own personal life was, was in, not in great shape. He had overspent. He, he, uh, he, was, he was an extravagant man, uh, that has to be said. Uh, he was also very committed to a uh, bourgeois family and and uh, his wife and uh, uh, his, his wife was sick and was was shortly to die um, his he, he had formed a liaison with with a married woman uh, who also had had many children and they were just on the point of of uh, bringing their two menage together uh, in some despair at his situation, he had been selling uh, a lot of stuff from his, fr uh, uh, a lot of paintings, and he'd been rebuked by several of his uh, supporters among the critics for letting paintings go too quickly out of his, his studio. In particular, Emil Zola had really ticked him off for, for uh, being too easily satisfied. and. Uh, Sending, sending stuff out that, uh, that, that, that shouldn't have been, been seen. Well, <clears throat> this year, in 1880, he decided that he would, uh, after all, stop acting as an independent, would not show in the, in the, with, with, the, with, with his independent colleagues, but would instead go back to trying to get a painting into the official salon. And the painting on the left, seems rather a dirty slide, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. Um, the painting on the left is the painting that was in the end hung in the salon. <coughs> he, Monet was very, very quick to, to uh, uh, talk to the press and explain what he was doing to interested journalists. And uh, just very shortly after, uh, completing this painting, he gave an interview to, a, to a, a journalist in which he explained to him his absolute commitment to working from nature. Uh, the journalist asked at one point if he could see his studio. and Monet brushed him off, made a grand gesture down the, down the river and said, uh, there is my studio over there, indicating the whole of nature, sweeping his arm up in the sky. Well, actually, the paint was hardly dry on this painting on the left that had been painted indoors. Um, it was very much a studio painting. It was based on studies that he'd made in the open air. But as you can see, it's a sort of summertime painting, and the, the, uh, the painting was painted that winter. So uh, we come up again, in a very dramatic way, up against a kind of legend that... Monet is, is uh, creating about himself um, a legend that he himself gets caught up in uh, in a most practical way because there's no, no doubting the almost heroic way in which he projected himself out into the open. Um, working in storms, working uh, uh, on the seashore, being swept away by waves, uh, working uh, in, the, in the heat of the sun, uh, working under the most incredibly difficult situations, and continually, uh, even while 
doing this, continually promoting this idea of himself as a kind of sharpshooter, a kind of as though his subjects come up and, he's, and, 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 and he catches them on the wing. And this is developed very much as part of the, the whole uh, legend of, of, uh, of, his, uh, of his attack on his subject matter. Um, the, the, uh, the point is that this is just one of the paradoxes, one of the mysteries associated with, with, with Monet's activity. On the one hand, this commitment to working out of doors. On the other hand, this uh, willingness <coughs> repeatedly to work indoors uh, in the studio. Uh, and to, to, to rework uh, some of his studies and in a way to, 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 to almost to, to deny that that is what he is doing. So clearly there's something very strange going on there. There's a, there's a strange kind of, um, uh, is it a double thing? No, perhaps it isn't. Perhaps it's more complicated even than that. Perhaps. Perhaps he's doing something that he really can find no way of, of, of giving words to. What is going on when he paints in the studio? Well, let's remind ourselves uh, <coughs> just a minute what, what the painters of mid-19th century really thought, uh, thought they meant by, by, uh, uh, by the kind of claims for freedom and independence and uh, naivety that, that they were making. Well, there's that famous uh, remark that appears in Delacroix's journal and he says, ah, young artist, do you seek a subject then? Why, everything is a subject, for the subject is yourself. It's your impression, your emotion before nature. That is your subject, the your in both cases underlined. You see, the, the, uh, from Delacroix onwards, and it includes uh, Millet and Courbet and Coro and all the, the, the generation of the 30s, and comes to an absolute climax with, uh, with Monet's generation, uh, the, 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 uh, the idea of their individual subjectivity is linked also with the enterprise of an objective uh, search of, of landscape, of, the, of, of nature, of the outside world. So here is a further paradox, that, that this painting which claims to be realist and which, which somehow explains itself in the terms of realism, also at the same time is claiming its subjectivity, is claiming its, its uh, individuality. How can it be both? How can it be both realist, which means clearly, in a certain sense, objectively universal, and private, individual, naive, without reference to, 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 to others? Well, we have to remember that in this transaction between the painter and, and nature, between, mediating between the two, comes painting, comes paint, comes the canvas, comes the material, comes the experience of actually putting the picture together. Monet, as a as a young man, as a young, ambitious tiger, determined to find a foothold in the, in the official salon, had taken on his, his, uh, his, his, the people just a little bit older than himself. Manet, of course, on the left with the Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Courbet on the right, the, the Demoiselle au bord de la Seine, uh, two famously scandalous paintings that, that had, had uh, uh, sort of asserted the, the, the claims of the, the painter of modern life, uh, had, had uh, uh, on, uh, Courbet 
uh, showing the two girls of, of, of presumed doubtful virtue, enjoying a picnic on the bank of the, of the Seine, the, the, uh, the, 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 the rowing boat tied up um, uh, alongside. Uh, and slightly later, Manet painting this extraordinary ambiguous and, and, and uh, artificial uh, construction, uh, part uh, uh, paraphrase of, of, of an old master, of several old masters, part uh, uh, immediately uh, an, an, an immediate account of, of his friends um, in, this, in this sort of uh, th this extraordinary situation, um, half fantasy, half, half reality. Uh, Monet uh, had set himself to make his own answer to, to these attempts, to paint a déjeuner sur l'herbe that would be an ultimate uh, uh, plenarist, open-air answer to the, to, 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 the, to the Monet project. It was to be an enormous painting. It was to be 15 feet high and nearly 20 feet long. Uh, larger, considerably larger than Kobe's uh, studio, which has to be one of the largest paintings of the 19th century. Uh, he spent the summer of 1866 working in the forest of Fontainebleau, painting directly. I think we can probably assume that that studies like paintings like this marvelous group of trees on the left uh, was 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 done directly. Um, he was living in, a, in an inn there and, and painting, as far as we know, out in the open every day. And then towards, uh, th as the project for the, for the composition began to take shape, he persuaded friends to go and pose for him under the trees. Um, but it's quite clear that, that the painting itself, the, the, the final painting, wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't painted uh, indoors, in, out of doors. It couldn't possibly have been painted out of doors. This, what you see on the right here, is a study for it, a sort of sketch for the whole, uh, the whole thing. And um, I don't know, I have no idea, but one, one perhaps could, could, could assume that parts of it, if not all of it, were painted uh, directly from the, the friends who were coming to pose uh, bit by bit for the painting and, and uh, the trees and, and uh, uh, the, the place itself may very well have been been painted on the spot. But the point is that the painting itself, the final picture, was to, to be absolutely enormous. In fact, it doesn't exist anymore, only fragments of it, because the, it had to be, uh, he had to abandon it, he had to give up work on it, he had to, it was rolled up, it was taken off the stretcher and rolled up and it was left with various people. And then finally, uh, when it was unrolled again, it was proved to be damaged, and so he slashed it in pieces. And these are the only two fragments, the only two meaningful fragments that that remain of it. <coughs> By the way, it's so nice to see Graham Nixon entertaining his friends with a bottle of wine as usual. <laughs> but <coughs> it's uh, good to think that these traditions go on. Um, the, the, the thing that is so astonishing about this painting, then, is, is, and I think you can probably see enough from these fragments, to get, is to see with what courage he had, he had taken the terms of a sketch and somehow formalized it and enlarged it onto an enormous scale. So that the, 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 the you see how on the left, uh, how these great slabs of paint go down uh, uh, breaking up the, the form into, into effects of light, um, reducing the, the, the whole scene to a kind of jagged pattern of light painting that can only be conceived of in terms of, of light falling on actual surfaces seen at a distance. There's no sense in which, there's no sense of academic modeling or of internal construction of the figures in, in, in a traditional sense. It's one of the most radical attempts that anybody could possibly uh, uh, imagine. And one can very well suppose that even if he had completed it to his, to his uh, satisfaction, 
he couldn't possibly have, have, have got it into the salon. Nobody would have taken it seriously at all, I think. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, story, this painting. Now, there's, another, there's a further aspect of the painting that, that I think needs to be taken into account. That is to say that, that unlike either the, the Kobe that we were looking at a minute ago or the, the money, there is no internal narrative to the painting that uh, shapes or, or, or uh, uh, organizes the behavior of the figures within it. They are simply doing what they're doing. Uh, no, one woman is leaning forward and adjusting a plate, another man is gesturing with his, uh, with his walking stick, a uh, woman is adjusting her hair, another, another woman is just apparently standing. Nobody's eye meets anybody else's. There's absolutely no narrative content at all. And to visualize the effect of this in a painting constructed on the scale of a, of a, of a great history painting is one of the most extraordinary uh, things that one can imagine. What can can be intended by it. Well, realizing, I suppose, that, that uh, the project of painting such a, where are we? Oh no, sorry. That's it, good. Um, realizing, I suppose, that such a, uh, such a pain, painting on that sort of size was, was really, uh, unmanageable but still determined to, to, to make a large figure composition, uh, he actually went one further and uh, the following year he, he, he painted, he started to work on the, the famous painting on the right, The Women in the Garden and d he was determined to carry this right through uh, from observation whether he in fact did or not is anybody's guess. But anyway, he, he set up an easel in, in the garden the, of the house that he was staying in with his, 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 then, uh, his then mistress, Camille, uh, and he actually uh, rigged up a sort of pulley for the, for the, uh, the canvas, which is a very large canvas, um, and uh, uh, dug a trench in the ground so that he could, he could run the, the canvas up and down could work on the top of the canvas uh, when, he, when he needed to by adjusting it and, and sliding it down into the trench. Kobe is supposed to have uh, visited him while he was working on it and to have been enormously amused at this arrangement um, and, and very puzzled when the sun went in and Monet stopped painting. And uh, he, Kobe asked him why, why he'd put down his brushes and, and why, why he wasn't getting on with it. And so the story goes, Monet had to explain to him rather laboriously that, that uh, the sun was part of the subject, the sunlight was part of the subject. So he had to wait for it to come back. Whether that's true or not, one doesn't know. Maybe, like so many stories, like so many stories about pain, painters, it may very well have been invented in order to make a point. But one doesn't know. Life has so many lessons in it, doesn't it? Um, the point that, that I think I, I, I want to, to, to bring out uh, about the women in the garden uh, that I think is of, of very great interest and really introduces the, 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 the next general point that I want to make is that in this beautiful scene in which the women are moving about wearing very much like women in fashion, contemporary fashion plates, it's extraordinarily like an illustration from a contemporary fashion magazine, as a matter of fact. The poses, the attitudes, <coughs> that complete absence of narrative coherence, the fact they're just there, um, in, a, in, a, in, in a way that's not all that easy to explain because it seems very strange that two of them should be standing and then that other, the other girl should be si seated at their foot. Uh, if, it, if, it, uh, um, if, if one's not to visualize the scene as a sort of 
opportunity to show off her dress and to, to act like somebody in a fashion plate. But the point is that, that the very nature of the subject itself the leaves seen against the sky, the, the, the dappling of, of light against the, the tree trunks, the flowers, the patterns on the women's dresses, the long line of buttons, the, the dots, the, 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 the little scallop patterns around, all of this painted directly undertaken with the brush create a surface that in itself gives back a degree of vibration, <laughs> a degree of animation that uh, begins to operate upon the, the, the eye uh, in a direct way, not by virtue of its, of its uh, narrative, but in a direct and physiological way. And this is a matter of enormous importance because, you see, it, it uh, introduces into painting the consequences of looking, the consequences of looking. The, <coughs> the very subject of looking, of people looking, people looking at things, people, people looking at views, people looking through binoculars and, and, and uh, opera glasses and things like that, but simply sitting, looking. This very subject becomes uh, uh, familiar to, to the painters of this time. They all had a go, Monet in particular, but also Degas in a very, very striking way. And the great painting of the, the terrace at Saint Andres um, uh, in the Metropolitan that you all know, this sort of strange, rather ugly, rather harsh, rather, uh, rather gritty kind of painting, and yet a painting of extraordinary interest. Uh, is surely, if it's anything, is a painting about looking. Um, just uh, take account of, the, of, of what is happening here. In the first place, the painter is clearly at, a, at a, maybe a second floor window overlooking the, the, the garden, the terrace. Um, so that there's between us and the events of the, uh, of, of the painting, there are two sort of zones of, of, of dead ground, of, of, of un, unrecognized space, between us uh, and the immediate foreground of the painting, and then from the, the fence between the, 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 the terrace and, and the sea. Um, Within that stage, if you like, the, the flags, it's as though the flags carve, carve out a kind of picture, as though they frame a picture in the center. And the, the two figures in the foreground, the, his father on the right and his arm dead center, uh, are sitting there like an audience. And the direction of the light and the, 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 the very perspective of of the chairs and their attitude is is sweeping forward obliquely into that that framing uh, uh, shape of the of, of the picture, and then there are a whole lot of very strange things that 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 that, that, that happen as well. For example, that curious distortion of the perspective of the fence over on the right hand side of the painting. There's some people have written about this painting and argued that it's a kind of compositional adjustment that's made uh, in order to, uh, for, for sort of purely aesthetic reasons, the, the, the horizon of the sky, uh, of, the, of the sea is artificially lifted in order to, to uh, um, balance the painting out or something like that. That doesn't really make much sense to me at all. It seems to me that what that that uh, direction of the fence is doing, that upper profile of the fence is doing, uh, is joining up with the boat, with the sails of the boat, making an axis going across like that, and then pointing with tremendous intensity at the figure of the man in the top hat, who is exactly, it seems to me, exactly 
the, 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 the marker of Monet's position in front, Monet's own position in front of the, uh, of the whole scene. So that that vertical alignment from the large boat on the horizon to the top man in the top hat right down to where Monet is standing fixes his position in, in, in front of, of this scene. It's very, very much about a painting about looking. Um, and uh, uh, it's about a whole lot of other things besides, but I talked about them last time I was here. Um, the, the, the painting on the right, too, uh, can be construed in exactly that sense. Look how, how, in, uh, how crucial that group of figures on the left is in our whole reading of the painting. Um, the, uh, uh, situ situated as an, as an audience going <laughs> leftwards, looking out uh, to, the, to the open end of the painting on the right. Uh, and of course the, the, uh, the f famous uh, Chicago painting of Camille sitting on the, on the river bank uh, very much in that, in that uh, uh, sort of canonical observer's position ever since the very early days of Romanticism, uh, uh, landscapes have been likely to contain a figure somewhere in the foreground looking out that allows us to somehow identify with that figure in the absorption of the of the landscape, but also in a certain sense, I uh, recognise some identity between the looking of that figure and the looking of the painter uh, into the into the painting. <coughs> in the the terrace, the the painting that we were looking at just a minute minute ago. Monet is juxtaposing two apparently irreconcilable schema. The flatness of the sea and the per perspectival stage-like space of the terrace. Now, perspective in landscape invariably refers to architectural movements, to architectural movements along a road or down an avenue or between houses, and such landscape motifs reach out for spatial markers of a regular kind and in so doing they set up diagonal grids in which the meeting point is the far horizon. Perspective in other words places the onlooker. The frontal expanse of the sea on the other hand does something quite different from that. It enfolds him. And I want now to talk about these two contrasting schemas, which are like the sort of poles of, of landscape experience. And what I'm trying to work towards here is the idea that the kinds of places, the kinds of subjects that Monet painted, actually feed back in a certain way into his idea of what pictorial possibility and pictorial structure can be. And that, in other words, there's a very, very strong reciprocal relationship at work between the painter and his choices and the landscape and its possibilities as he looks at it. Consider for a moment and here I must apologize for an absolutely disgusting slide, the painting on the left, which is a wonderful, cool, cold, icy painting of extraordinary beauty, and it comes out looking like a melted chocolate ice cream. I do, do apologize, but there we are. What can you do? Um, he painted it during the snowy winter of uh, 1875 at Argentine. He's sighting along the length of the fence that uh, passes just to the right of his easel. Um, he's, we know exactly where he's standing. We can feel the width of the snowy path between the fence and the newly painted trees on the right. The, the structure of the whole painting is determined 
by this statement of his place within it. The path stretches vertically away from where he's standing, <coughs> unbroken until it disappears into the snow-laden distance. He's completely in command of the space in the painting. Everything is determined by him. He moves, everything else moves. The exact necessary locking together of forms in, in perspective or by alignment or by overlap reinforces the importance that he gives to this particular view over all others. He could have looked in any direction, but this is the one that counts now. Inevitably, we are drawn into the distance and into trying to make out the blurred and misty events at the far end at the far edge of the platform. Events that face him at precisely his eye level and in the axis of his glance. We feel the control, his control, of a complete array of relationships. This scene, this section of the world, opens out like a fan from his point of viewing, a fan over which he has complete control. The road is nothing if not an invitation to action. A willed movement in which the eye leaps forward as the advance guard and into which the horizon, that mysterious rendezvous of infinity and an absolute here, his viewpoint, continuously asserts itself as a goal. It's worth remembering, I think, in connection with the importance the, 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 the extraordinary importance that these perspectival down the road type compositions had for Monet. I think it's worth remembering that here's a painter who never once, as far as we know, ever painted the nude. Um, the reason why I say that here is because I think it's, I think that, that I see this kind of, uh, that his relationship to these perspectival subjects as being very much an, expre an erotic expression, a controlling and dominating erotic expression of, uh, in which space becomes, in some extraordinarily sublimated way, space becomes the subject for his, for his control. But there was a complete opposite side to I'd like to, 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 to have a, a perspective on one side, but to remind you of a completely different kind of subject, a completely different structure that meant an enormous amount to him uh, also, but in which, the, in which the whole dynamic of space offers a completely different relationship to the, to the onlooker. And I'm talking, of course, of... Uh, the experience of looking out to sea. The invitation proffered by the sea is of a, of a completely different kind. For here, nothing is interposed. There are no occlusions. Nothing overlaps with anything else. The sea's movement is its own movement. It doesn't move as Monet moves. In the most literal sense, looking at the sea, we are taken out of ourselves. It's not a path that faces us, but a desert. And hence, perhaps, the special poignance that's so easily vulgarized of those moments in nature when a setting sun or a moon does indeed lay a path before us, made of gleams. Immensity, Bachelard says, I think it's in, in that book, Fizz About Space, immensity is the movement of motionless man. If we imagine the characteristic experience of looking at the sea in relation to a canvas, we must picture not only the absence of focal points, but an equality of meaning all over the picture surface. The eye doesn't move from point to point, it sort of drifts. The canvas is one, an unbroken surface. Yet one part of the canvas is always elsewhere in relation to another. That's to say, it's not connected by pathways by pathways. Under the rubric of planarism, 
The sea as a motive is the primary model for pictorial unity, just as the road in perspective as a motive is the primary model for spatial control. Monet's relation with the sea was very, very long-standing. His very first triumphs as a painter were as a, uh, uh, with painting marines. And, uh, of course, I'm not pretending at all that uh, the, the developments, the really extraordinary developments in his thoughts about pictorial composition and the structuring of paintings were only to do with the fact that he, he had experienced painting the sea. There are lots of other models out there ha happening of a new kind of composition, a composition that was completely inimical to, to the traditions of pictorial structure where, uh, uh, where there's always a certain dramatic focus and the, the architecture of the painting is in some way related to what is happening within the painting. This beautiful Manet, for example, is, is marvelously dispersed. You don't know which way to look. First here, first there. Nobody seems to be looking at anybody else. Nobody's talking to anybody else. Things are just happening all over. And, and the eye goes round and round. And it's marvelous. It feels just as if you're out in the open air, sort of stumbling along, not knowing which way to look. And the, the Buddha on the right, Buddha Monet's old, old master, the man who first encouraged him to work out of doors, himself had these extraordinary experiments with paintings of the, of the beach where, again, there's no narrative structure within the painting and, and, and consequently no uh, architecture, no pictorial architecture that relates to what is happening within the painting but relates only to an external experience, the, exter the experience of nature. Uh, and so we find, as Monet continues, really extraordinarily radical experiments. Uh, the image on the left, I wanted to remind you about, probably you all know it, it's, a, it's an etching from a beautiful series that, that Monet's friend Dobigny, a slightly older painter, who was a passionate painter uh, out of doors, and who had a floating studio um, that Monet later modeled his floating studio on. And uh, at a certain point, he published a, a series of etchings about his life on the studio, uh, uh, on his floating, his, his, his sort of houseboat studio. And they're an absolutely charming group of etchings. But what I wanted you to draw your attention to here is the painting, I don't know how well you can see it, right down, that's propped up against the wall, right down in the bottom right-hand corner of the painting. And you can see that it's a view across the river with a row of willow trees. Just bang, bang, bang. No pretense of arrangement, no, no recession or anything. Just a row, bang, bang, bang. And if you look very closely, between each tree, you can see the letters R, E, A, L. <laughs> the realism <laughs> it's written between the trees. It's a funny little joke that, that Daubigny inserts into, the, into, in, into this etching. Well, of course, what he's referring to is the kind of, 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 of composition that is forced upon the, the painter sitting there in his boat, looking at the other side of the river. He wants to paint a willow tree, but what else can he do? But, but just put it down there, bang, 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 in a row, because there they are. Uh, however, you can see how this way of thinking leads to the most, this way of seeing leads to the most extraordinary radical paintings, paintings the like of which had never been seen before. The, the, you all know these two paintings, they're in the Metropolitan, another lousy melted chocolate slide, I'm afraid, of, of the one on the left, this view across the, the river Creuse, the sort of torrent of of the crows, in which there's no horizon, no, no, no entry to the painting at all, simply a, 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 a continuous brushing of the canvas that sets the eye moving here, now here, now there, without a focal point or, or, or direction or anything, sustained, sustained all the way through by the 
understanding and the apprehension of a first-hand experience. And of course, I needn't comment on the, the extraordinary willow tree paintings, uh, painting of which this is perhaps the most frontal, the most abrupt in its frontality, the most symmetrical in its structure. I want to move on from the question of, of composition to the matter of, of, uh, of the actual brushstroke itself. Because, you see, it's here that, again, something, something really quite, quite extraordinary begins to happen. I've already commented on how the, the, um, the kind of subjects uh, that that money uh, kind of motives that he was painting begin to 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 give back simply in the terms of his description of them begin to give back a range of pictorial vibration and agitation and movement that uh, was unprecedented. Uh, Delacroix had many, many, many times in his, in his written journal commented on the necessity to, uh, to find a way of constructing a painting such that even in its full development it still had the freshness of its first working. And I think that the, the, the last, the great last works, the Saint-Sulpice uh, uh, war paintings, uh, were of enormous importance to, to Monet's generation from exactly that point of view. The, I, I'm not sure how well you can see in, 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 in the slide, but the, the, there's an, an extraordinary kind of a uh, reworking, a final reworking of the whole painting in which Delacroix's brush is as vivid and as sharp as if he were drawing the thing for the first time. Furthermore, uh, the, the brush is introducing a very complex uh, uh, sort of weaving together of the, the palette of the painting so that um, uh, it, it's almost impossible for the eye to, to come finally to rest on any, any particular point. It's a tremendously dynamic surface that, that is being worked out there. With, with Monet, who I think studied uh, particularly those last Delacroix very closely indeed, with Monet, something like this was beginning to force himself upon his... Uh, something, some sort of parallel issue is being forced for itself upon him, because he was coming up against the, this the, the the problem of developing his paintings, of carrying them beyond the state of the initial state sketch. Uh, by now, by the time we're looking now at this great composition of the, the uh, uh, breakfast in the garden, lunch in the garden or whatever it's called, um, is the mid-70s. And he's, he's now, by now he's done a, a, a lot of very direct painting. He's, he's uh, uh, been working on a smaller scale uh, and, and now he's beginning to, to, to turn to, to larger and more ambitious themes again. But he's determined not to leave that the, the quality of the sketch behind. Um, just let me remind you of some of the works of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the initiation of this radical language that he had developed. These are the, uh, the you know very well, the paintings made at La Grenouillère, um, in in uh, 69, just before the Franco-Prussian War, when uh, the the uh, attempt to work directly from from observation and directly by the light uh, is 
is, is just carried as far as, it, as, as far as it can logically go. And uh, the whole scene, depending very, very much on the nature of, uh, uh, of the scene itself, the, the rippling water, the reflection of light on the water, the rhyming of the structure of the boats with the ripples on the water, the, uh, the, 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 the bathing, the, the agitation, the, 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 the thro breaking up of the surface of the water by the bathers, the light glittering off the, 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 the river uh, once you get out from under the trees, uh, the uh, light striking down through the, through the leaves of the trees, all the way through this uh, amazing painting and its its uh, and the other famous one the, the one in the um, in the point um, all the way through these these extraordinary paintings were discovering uh, these th these unprecedented surfaces uh, things happening in the painting that uh, that that have no parallel anywhere else in in in, in painting and yet they're brought to us through the first-hand uh, experience of, uh, of, um, uh, of real phenomena, of water, of movement, of light, of, of, of uh, leaves, of even of people. Now, it's paintings like this that, I think, that first caused critics to reproach Monet for kind of crude, materialistic, indifferent, to subject matter. Um, the figures, you might say, are treated in, with exactly the same, in exactly the same spirit as the ripples of the water or the leaves on the trees. They have absolutely no, no presence in a, in a human sense. And in a certain way, one can say that that's true. But the point is that, that the, the the human presence, in exactly the terms in which De Delacroix, in that quotation I read to him, meant it. Uh, the, the human presence is given back to us through the, through the painting itself. Uh, through, this is the importance that suddenly the very brushing of paint begins to take on. Just as in the perspective paintings, we could locate ourselves standing where Monet was standing, so now, uh, just looking at the paint, just reading the paint itself, we identify ourselves with his eye and his hand. So that, uh, to, to an extraordinary degree, subject matter, even though it appears in a certain sense to be withdrawn, to be sort of drained off from what it is that we see, the picture that's depicted as a picture, and, but as it does so, it infuses with a richer and richer in a richer and richer way, the very fabric of the painting itself. And we cannot get come to terms with the painting uh, uh, without uh, somehow gaining access to the act of painting and the, 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 the reading of, of, the, of the scene uh, in those terms. Uh, I just want to remind you here of, of the what is believed to be the final version uh, of his, his work at La Grenouillère. The painting is lost, um, and uh, for a long time, uh, it, it, uh, nobody knew quite how big the painting was. Um, but then uh, Robert Gordon, and in his inimitable way, discovered a photograph of the painting actually hanging in uh, the collector's, the German collector's uh, house. And because some of the other paintings that were hanging alongside it are known, uh, it was possible to, to deduce the, the size of the painting. It's not tremendously big. It's, I think, a, a, a meter and a half in its longest dimension. At least that's the calculation. Alas, it was lost. It apparently was destroyed by um, in, in Russian soldiers after the after the war, um, I w but I want to. Sh the, the painting on the right is another reminder of 
of the importance that that water and these river subjects, water reflections, the, the, the uh, breaking and dispersal of, of, uh, uh, of the world, the recreation of the world through, through the, the reflecting and, and uh, vibrating uh, effects of the, of, of the surface of the river. And his direct translation of this into moves of, of the brush. And then again to uh, remind you of, of later developments, as uh, during the, 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 the 80s, when he was traveling about all over the, the country, as well as painting his familiar subjects near home on the, on the banks of the Seine, that, uh, that improvis improvisation with the, uh, of, of, of touch, uh, becomes once he had once he had conquered it as a kind of personal expression it, it then moves out again into the subject and it becomes very very closely tied for a while with what it is that is depicted uh, these two amazing paintings of of uh, poplar trees on the side of the water reflected uh, the painting on the right which probably many of you know it's in Philadelphia, is one of the most interesting paintings uh, uh, of, of this period, where it almost feels as if the whole canvas is going to be taken up in this, this web of, of tiny marks that glitter and shine and vibrate and flutter uh, in a way that's marvelously analogous to the leaves, the way the leaves behave on, on poplar trees in a slight breeze. Uh, but, of course, that's not, not the end of the story at all. Flowers, um, uh, uh, the, the heavy, uh, laden effects of, of, um, uh, of, a, of, of a meadow, an overgrown meadow, uh, or uh, when he's out on the Normandy cliffs, the way that, that the movement of the brush uh, I say in that in the Brooklyn painting on the right that you probably many of you know where that the movement of the brush sort of whips the bushes as though the very wind was blowing through through the paint uh, and meanwhile the changes scale as he moves out across the water changes its direction moves laterally uh, in this strange kind of uh, uh, rocking motion that takes us right across the, 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 the incoming tide. Um, uh, and, and here, the, the look at the change of, of direction and, 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 and momentum in the brushing between the great uh, slope of the cliff and the, the sea over to the right. Notice that in both these paintings, which are very very, very characteristic of the work that he was doing through the 80s uh, on the cliffs, uh, the Normandy cliffs, and also uh, on the cliffs in, in, in Belle Isle in, in Brittany. You notice that <coughs> uh, he's now no longer uh, present in the painting in the way that he was in those, in those early studies. The whole scale of the enterprise seems to have changed. We have very much the feeling of, 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 uh, of, of distance between us, uh, uh, as though we're looking, looking at the world across a, a gulf, across an interval. Um, uh, he's in, indeed on one promontory looking across a valley, as it were, to another and then right further down to the sea beyond. Extraordinary kind of uh, vertiginous uh, control of space that's being um, uh, explored here. Uh, but always, it seems to me, invoking that enveloping and, and, and um, uh, the enveloping continuity of the, of the sea itself. But now it's as though space and light are being treated in a way that's exactly analogous to, to, uh, uh, to the sea. Um, I wanted to uh, draw your attention in 
and the painting on the left to some really extraordinary things that are beginning to happen within this kind of variegated, variegated brushing. You see how the bushes in the foreground, there's a kind of staccato scale to the, to the way in which their presence is indicated. And then uh, the hillside beyond begins to, to sweep sideways like this. And then as we get up to the top, we must imagine the sun going down over, over on our left side somewhere, over here. And that reddish, the reddish light begins to break across the, the crest of the hill. And suddenly we get caught up in these long, raking, blood red strokes that have no, clearly have no descriptive uh, uh, intention at all. At least it's not descriptive in the sense that you can say precisely this brush stroke stands for this aspect of nature. Suddenly something quite different from that is happening. Suddenly the, 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 the movement of paint and, and, and the brush and color as we go through the painting is taking on a kind of autonomous sense of its own and is reconstructing a world that we believe in, it's totally convincing, but we cannot pin it down simply as description. In other words, to go back to the, the point that I was trying to make at the very, very beginning, it's as though suddenly it, it, it has become impossible for us to, to make that separation, that traditional separation between form and content, because to, to, to isolate either the formal aspects or the descriptive aspects and talk about them as though they were somehow separable from each other simply does not make sense. It doesn't meet with, with what meets our eye uh, when we look at the painting. I invite you to look at the, at, at the left-hand side of this painting here and really try and, try and unravel in your, in your, mind, in your mind what it is that you're reacting to, what it is that you're seeing. Are you seeing the description of water? Are you seeing paint about water? Or are you seeing uh, uh, paint which is beginning to generate some kind of sense of its own uh, that doesn't derive descriptively from, from the thing painted, but in some is in some way uh, engaged in a kind of interior dialogue within the painting that that uh, makes its um, makes its reality felt. Towards the end of the oh sorry we seem to, wait a minute. Uh, Okay, now. There we go, that's what I wanted. Um, the painting on the left, uh, I think probably painted from almost exactly the same point as, as the one on the right, uh, was, was painted about, I think, about 15 years later in the 90s. And you can see that now something very different has begun to, to take the place of that sort of tactile, uh, uh, brushed uh, connection with the, with, with, with the, the, the motive. Uh, now the whole sense of atmosphere and, and, and light of the envelope, to, to use his favorite phrase, the envelope, has taken over completely. And the, the, the movement of the brush is much, much more closely related to the, 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 the total fabric of the painting than it is to any individual part. In fact, it's very hard, apart from the little boats floating along, it's very hard really to pick out any individual part of the, the, uh, the later painting. Well, of course, what had happened was that, uh, now, now why does it skip? Doesn't that one want to drop? 
It should be a... No. Well, that's funny, it did a minute ago, didn't it? There we go, good. What had happened was that he had begun to 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 work on the on the uh, the uh, famous series and uh, the ones of the these are, these, these are two sort of two of the the grain stack series of uh, of uh, eighteen ninety one and truth of importance to in Monet's life, the, f the moment at which he began to show these paintings, because it was really right now that suddenly the the public caught on and he, he, he was suddenly tremendously successful and was selling paintings uh, at unprecedented prices for, for an independent <coughs> painter. Well, the, perhaps one of the reasons why uh, the, the, the series became so enormously popular was because within the format of, of the series of paintings it was possible to see or at least it was possible to tell yourself that you could see what all this was about about painting of the painting of instantaneous events of painting of particular effects of light and, and weather and so forth. And uh, the, the, you see, right from the very moment when Monet had first started to show, uh, I show you a painting of the early 70s on the left, I think it was in the first Impressionist exhibition, and was noticed by several critics, all of whom commented on the way in which, as they understood it, Monet was seizing the instant that that somehow this was this was a, a, a moment of time, and it was typical of the city and of modern life and, and, and how time uh, set its stamp on 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 a particular moment, and uh, they. Were, there was the usual reproach that it was just a sketch that he must learn to study and to, to make things of a more enduring character. But uh, they didn't in the slightest withhold their admiration for his ability to, to make this kind of instantaneous, as they thought, account of a particular effect of light. Well, with the series, uh, the temptation uh, was to look at these paintings in that sense and uh, uh, Monet's great friend the journalist and politician uh, Georges Clemenceau who wrote a very very enthusiastic review of the exhibition of the cathedrals the Rouen cathedral facades when they were, were first shown and uh, made actually quite a fuss and said that the whole series should be kept together and the French state should buy it and so on. Uh, he, the way in which he interpreted the, the series was in what we would think of as a sort of cinematic way in which, in which uh, this painting was, uh, you know, quarter to 11 in the morning and this one was half past 12 and so on. Um, uh, as though each painting uh, caught a particular moment in time. And in a way, Monet was, went along with that interpretation. He was all, the whole time, he was saying, well, it's really very easy to understand. Um, I, I take a canvas and I paint on it as long as the effect lasts, and then I take another canvas and I paint on that for as long as the effect lasts. But of course, again, uh, we come up against the, the myth-making. It just didn't work like that. Uh, you, can, you only have to look at, at, at closely at any of these paintings. This is a detail from the one in the Metropolitan, and this is a, a detail from uh, one, uh, one of the raw facades that's in in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow, you only have to look at, at, at the detail to realize that they are enormously labored paintings. 
Uh, he went on and on and on with them. He worked on them both in Rouen over a period of two years, and but also back in the, in the studio. And uh, uh, the paint gets to be very thick, gets to be really tremendously laboured. And there's absolutely no sense in which one can think of them as um, instantaneous uh, sort of snapshots of the of a particular effect of light. So what is happening here? Well, it's quite clear that that uh, uh, something much more um, demanding than a sketch is is being put together here. Um, the uh, the uh, the idea uh, of uh, the moment of, of clock time that uh, earlier critics of his work had always referred to really has to give way to um, a, a different idea of time, perhaps an idea of time similar to the, the idea of, of durée, of duration that the philosopher Bergson was, was talking about at that time. Um, a, an idea of time that includes not simply the, 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 the passage of time across the face of the clock, but the passage of time across one's consciousness, in which it would include both memories and anticipations and uh, all those subjective changes of time that, that, that we undergo in the course of life and uh, which um, uh, uh, clearly, uh, in, in a variety of ways, gets built into the, the constructing of painting. Uh, I'm skipping along. There's no way in which one can begin f to, to cover all the, the aspects of this, um, this tremendously long and busy life. Uh, you know that towards the end of the 90s, he had bought a, a property and had begun to garden it. He was a passionate gardener all his life. And at a certain point, he began uh, to paint uh, the garden itself and uh, a water garden that he had planted with water lilies. And now he enters into the most extraordinary uh, final phase of, his, of this this tran these transactions with the motive that he is painting, in which the motive itself is affecting what he paints, just as he, in turn, is reshaping it on the canvas. Only here, uh, by a kind of a, a really strange kind of uh, completion of the whole cycle, he is uh, he is actually shaping and controlling uh, the motive itself, having planted the the water lilies, having uh, installed the footbridge, having uh, directed the <coughs> pruning and the trimming and the whole disposition of the garden. So that, in a certain sense, uh, that element of envelopment that I've been talking about in relation to the motive of the sea now uh, is, is literally enacted. And uh, he finds himself uh, staring into the depths of this pond and making kinds of paintings the like of which had never been seen before. The, the, uh, the, to begin with, as you saw from those last two slides, uh, he concentrates really and he tries to control what, what he's painting uh, through a kind of perspective uh, um, uh, of the surface of the water, often framed by the, by the bridge itself and often terminated by the far bank of the, of the pond. But within a few years, that structure gives way to something much more radical in which the, the, uh, uh, the far bank is, is no longer seen. Uh, he, he showed them after several sort of false starts. I mean, he, 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 he painted it, as far as I know, them in 1906 and 1907 and then continued to work on them having promised them for an exhibition that wasn't <laughs> finally wasn't held until 1909. The persistent motive in the series when it was finally shown proved to be the reflection of a patch of sky seen through a gap 
between two trees on the far side of the pond. The canvases were of upright format. There was no horizon. The painting, the painter was looking downward into the water, whose surface was marked out by clusters of floating lily pads. The sky, that's the sort of reflection of the sky, makes a wobbling, irregular pyramid, its base at the foot of the canvas, its apex stretched like a neck to the top edge. Thus, the nearest reflections are at the top of the canvas, and the reflections furthest from us are at the bottom, countering the direction of the water's surface, whose plane is marked out clearly in the perspective of the round lilies. And to this mirroring of direction is added a strange paradox. The wobbling pyramid of the sky invokes a kind of recession, a kind of wandering pseudo-perspective that sets the eye drifting back up the canvas, searching for a vanishing point that is not there, pushing into a distance that is other than the distance of the receding surface of the pond. The colour in these paintings is brushed on in open marks, long flickering streaks, layer upon layer, running up and down the canvas, now sealing, seeming to call up the water itself, now the reflections upon it, now the light within it, and the water weeds within that. The lilies are patches of colour, sometimes still, more often whipped in fast, whipped in in ovals of blue and green and violet, always moving from side to side across the vertical strokes of the water, asserting its surface. The marks are speedy. There's a range of scale and direction that is sometimes descriptive, the flattened oval twirls of the lilies, the long dangling lines that make the reflections of the weeping willow, and that sometimes seem to answer to nothing but the flow of his thoughts across the surface of the canvas. What is finished here, what is finished here, is the bringing forth of his own presence at the side of the, at the, side of the pool, and the bringing forth of the pool as mirror. The picture is of his looking into the mirror of the motif is looking into the mirror of the water. He is looking into the mirror of the canvas and his discovery in reflection and reflection of his own looking. Now, that's where I should really stop. But I'm just, I, I, I can't, just as a sort of coda, I want to take you very, very quickly to remind you of what happened after, after this. His... Uh, he had, ever since he started working with the, with the pond, with the, the, the water lilies, he'd conceived of the idea of a decoration, of, use, of, of making paintings out of the, uh, the, the, the uh, water lilies, which would occupy an environment. And where that element of reflection and absorption that I've already been talking about, remember this there he is painting, there is the canvas, there is the, the, the pond with the water lilies on it, and, but he made that too. So there, there's Monet, there's the painting, there's his subject, and this reciprocity that I've been talking about between the motif and the painter and the painting is more closely bound together than anybody could ever have imagined this being. Now he conceives of the idea of making paintings that would surround the onlooker. Um, he had played with this idea, but again, in the, uh, in the years just before the beginning of the First World War, bad times happened. His, he became ill. He, his eyes began to go funny. Uh, his, his wife, his second wife, Alice, died. He missed her terribly. He became terribly depressed, and he was feeling his old age, a man who was so proud of his vitality. Uh, 
Georges Clemenceau, who by now was a real big shot, he was a leading radical politician. He was uh, shortly to become prime minister and, and within a few years to become the president of France during the crucial years of the latter years of the First World War. And Clemenceau shook him out of it, persuaded him, you must, you, you must uh, conclude this extraordinary project because now Monet was talking about painting large paintings, large paintings and, and somehow finding a way of showing them in a way that completely absorbed and surrounded the onlooker. Well, his eyes were deteriorating and although Clemenceau uh, made huge efforts to speed this along, and even during, once the war had started, he sort of pulled strings and made it possible for Monet to, to build an enormous studio big enough to hold these canvases. Uh, Monet's eyes were, 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 were going very bad on him. So the whole story of the construction of, these, of, of, of the final scheme of the water lily paintings is filled with just incredible... Uh, kind of obstacles and difficulties in which the constant factor is on the one hand Monet's um, endless uh, disappointment and, and, and anger and frustration uh, over the way the thing was going. He was unable to stop painting. He painted and painted and painted. Uh, and on the other hand uh, Clemenceau's determination to somehow see it through and completed uh, uh, the two paintings that you're looking at now are I think both paintings that were painted at a time, they're both easel paintings, they were painted directly clearly, I think they were both painted at a time when his eyesight was, was uh, really very, very bad. Uh, it was a cataract that was, was um, uh, making it awfully hard for him to see things. Some of the paintings are very, very blue and cold and some of them are very warm and 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 uh, and, and hot. Uh, he was he was so short-sighted at one point that he couldn't see color anymore. He couldn't trust color anymore. He could only see see tone, which is perhaps one of the reasons why these paintings still continue to work so marvelously. But it said that he would uh, have somebody read the labels of the of the tubes, and he could just perhaps himself make out the labels of the tubes so that he. He figured out what colors he was using in that way. And for years and years, of course, these paintings were suppressed and they were forgotten all about. And it wasn't really until, until fairly late that, that uh, after the Second World War that they began to be looked at with any kind of seriousness at all. Some of them are, in my view, among the, things, the best paintings he ever did. Marvelous paintings. But anyway, to, to try and press this through to its conclusion, he finally agreed to having an operation. And this was in 1922. Now, he had already made serious undertakings to Clemenceau to, to uh, give this, to complete this series of decorations and to give it as a kind of uh, war memorial to the, to the French state. Uh, I show you here, by the way, Robert Gordon, uh, is the person to turn to for the 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 uh, sort of individual um, uh, events, the small events in in this extraordinary story. It's a really very remarkable kind of account that exists of uh, of the battle to complete these paintings. A sort of battle on one hand against Monet's uh, uh, blindness. Uh, a battle against his his absolute refusal to to compromise or to give way or to, to agree that anything was going properly, his sort of built-in frustration and pessimism, and also, of course, a battle with his old age because he was by now getting very, very old. He was 80, in, wasn't he, in... Uh, <coughs> he was 80 in 1920 and he died in, in 1926. Um, what I wanted you to see here is the ground plan of the building that Clemenceau managed to, to, to get to house these, these uh, paintings. 
Uh, it was uh, on what you see on the, your left is a plan of the building as it exists now, the, the, the orangery in Paris. Uh, when uh, the, the plans were first shown, uh, it was divided up into rooms all the way along. And the, these two oval shapes linked by these little side uh, uh, corridors uh, are uh, the, the sort of compromise um, a solution to what Monet had most wanted to do. The drawing on your right possibly may ac actually be partly in his hand, but when shown the, the, the bare outlines of the, the building, this was, uh, these two eggs were, the, were, 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 were what he suggested. And you see that what happens there is that you come in at one end, uh, there are two ways in, and then uh, there's a sort of linking passage that, so that you can see through from, from one of these ovals to another. And then the ovals, you must imagine, lined with, with, with these enormous paintings that take you right round the inside of the, of the building. Um, and here, it's not a very useful slide, but uh, at the top, I mean, what, what you're seeing there is, is, is two of the enormous decorations, um, one above the other. You have to imagine these paintings on that sort of scale carried right around the room. So that his dream, which, was, which is really very truncated because his, his dream was much more elaborate and included uh, a, a row of paintings along the, the top of a sort of decorative... Um, uh, skeins and, and uh, of, of wisteria and other sorts of plants along the top and was, would have been far more uh, inclusive than the final installation. Um, well anyway, that's, that's, how, that's how, how it ended up. He never got to see this, this great scheme um, and one has to sort of think of the old boy standing there in his studio, uh, having kidded everybody all his life that he didn't have a studio. There he is uh, uh, with his, these, these easels, these rolling easels that he was so proud of. And when especially, especially uh, privileged visitors would come, he would, he would scoot the easels around so that, so that they were completely surrounded by these, these, uh, these great panels. Uh, well, I could go on talking about him forever, but I think I'd better stop there. <laughs>